Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, heartily welcome you all uh, on behalf of uh, the organizers uh, from the three colleges in this uh, special lecture in online mode, uh, jointly organized by the Department of English of uh, Egra Saroda Association College, uh, Department of English of Bharatpur College, and the Department of English of uh, Devra Thana Shahid Khudiram uh, Sriti Mohavid Dalla. Uh, at the very outset, uh, I'm extending my heartfelt gratitude to our uh, sole research person, uh, Dr. Sangjukta Chatterjee, uh, the head of the department and associate professor, uh, Department of English, Raiganji University. Uh, thanks a ton, madam, uh, for uh, giving your uh, kind consent uh, to share your knowledge with our students. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, well, uh, without uh, any further delay, uh, I would like to uh, start today's program officially through the welcome address uh, that is likely to be delivered uh, by the principal of Agra Sarada Association College, uh, Dr. Deepak Kumar Tamil. Uh, sir, uh, are you there? Uh, yes, yes. Over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, good morning. I, Dr. Deepak Kumar Tamil, principal. Of Agra SSB College, welcome you all in this special lecture in online on gender studies and English literature, paradigm and praxis, organized jointly by the Department of English, Agra Sharada Social College, Department of English, Kharagpur College, and Department of English, Devra Thana, Sohit Khuiram Sriti Mohabiddala. Earlier, the Department of English, Ekran Sarada Shoshibushan College, and Department of English, Sarada College, had collaboratively organized two online lecture series. We also had a collaborative association with Debra College, as well as had been a part of a webinar. These academic association as part of most signed between and have benefited our students a lot. Now, once again, we are venturing for such association for healthy academic. Is that your voice exchange. is not audible? And this time, of course, all these three colleges coming together through the same platform. Um, I would like to thank the principal, principal of our college, Dr. Vitu Sanokya, principal of Debra Khana, Dr. Rupa Dasgupta for collaborating with us. I also like to thank and express my regards to Dr. Sumjukta Chatterjee, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of English, Raigad University, and also our research person for giving her kind consent to be among with us. It is really a commendable effort made by the faculty members from these three colleges for organizing this special lecture in online for the benefit of the students. I think students of these three colleges will be benefited by the special lecture of Dr. Sangjukta Chatterjee. I wish a very good luck to all associated with this program for this success. Thanks and have a good day. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, your kind words. Uh, you always encourage us uh, to organize such uh, programs uh, for the betterment of our students. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, the principals from the other two colleges, uh, the principal of Kharagpur College, uh, Dr. Vidhut Shamanto, and the principal of Devra Panashwit uh, Kudiram Siti Mahavidyalwar, uh, Dr. Uh, Rupa Das uh, they were unable to uh, join today uh, because of some, uh, I mean, due to some unavoidable circumstance, uh, but uh, they have uh, conveyed their good wishes uh, for the success of this program. Uh, now, uh, without uh, much delay, uh, 
uh, I would like to, uh, I mean, we would like to proceed to the uh, main portion of uh, today's program, that is uh, the lecture of our resource parcel. Uh, and before that, I would like to request uh, our faculty member, uh, Mr. Shogoto Sang, uh, to uh, introduce uh, our resource parcel of today's lecture. Shogoto Sang, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, probably due to network, uh, poor network, uh, Madam is not there probably. Hello? Hello? Hello, Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, Madam. Yes, yes, yes. yes. You are audible, Madam. Uh, before it continues, let me just say one thing. Very small thing. Before it continues, uh, I am having some problems with the network connectivity. So if I am ever left out, please interrupt me and tell me uh, over telephone. So that I can connect back, okay? Because I am I'm worried. Just now it happened that there was a network failure at my area. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Okay. Okay. Over to you, sir. Sir, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Department of English, I cordially welcome you all to this special lecture titled Gender Studies and English Literature. Paradigms and uh, practice. I am super delighted and obviously it's an honor and pleasant opportunity to introduce to you the whole research person of today's event, Dr. Samjuk Sachadji. Uh, Dr. Samjuk Sachadji is an associate professor and head department of English, Raigon University, West Bengal, India. She has taught as the visiting faculty of Kunmatu University, Kullan in Odia, West Bengal. She is also the former director of the Center for Women Studies at Raigon University. She had run the center since its inception in 2018 to 2023. So she has a vast experience of conducting various kinds of workshops, conferences, and seminars related to the women studies. Dr. Samdukta Chatterjee had a good overall academic record. She has awarded the University Gold Medal for securing the first class first position in MA at the University of North Bengal. Dr. Chatterjee has a research interest in Eastern Himalayan studies, post-colonial feminism, nationalism, and also the Social Studies of Science. She is interested in activism as well as academics because she is herself a member of various renowned international NGOs that are for women's cause and women's rights. She has contributed numerous articles on literary topics in various national and national journals. She has also presented papers in various national and international seminars in India. She has also been invited as research person and keynote speaker in numerous webinars, seminars, and refresher courses. In March 2023, Dr. Chatterjee has been invited to deliver a talk in a refresher course on women's studies organized by Benaras Hindu University. Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh. She has also been a trainer in numerous faculty development programs. She has also chaired sessions in various international conferences and has participated in Winter School IIS Simla, Madhya Pradesh in 2021. Actually, being the head of the Department of English at Raigun University, during 2016 to 2018 and right now she is in her second phase of headship that has started from 2022. She regularly delivers the lectures and talks on various topics and she has got audit on PhD candidate whose work was on the rewriting of myths in contemporary Indian novels and she has guided empty presentations also. Her publications 
range from Indian folk studies to Indian feminist studies and from eco criticism to life writing. She has published chapters in Rutledge and she is also a reviewer of Rutledge right now. Happy to share, very recently she has also contributed a chapter in a Rutledge edited volume on Indian classical literature. She has been acting as external examiner of doctoral research work at various universities in India. She has also acted as the external adjudicator at Viva Voices of PhD scholars. She was also the convener of an international conference on work in class and text in 2026-16 that was held at the Department of English, Raigon University. Apart from that, she was also the joint convener at today's international conference on gender equality and women's rights, exploring women's voices and experiences in South Asia, sponsored by ICSSR, Ministry of Education, Government of India, where the participants and resource persons were from all over the subcontinent and also from US. She was the convener of the numerous conferences. She has also acted as a convener in an online lecture titled Women in Higher Education in India, Prospects and Challenges. She has also acted as the coordinator of the lecture series hosted by the Department of English Raigon University titled Literary and Critical Thoughts. Dr. Saturday is also an activist and she is right now working for the education of children of lesser privileged women in the society. And the school is located at Siliguri and she is one of the members of the academic board of that school that functions the education of the children and right now the strength of the children of that school has gone up to 284 and is a person who is suffering her time in academic and activism she also likes to identify herself animal rights activist her life and career have been very vivid uh, it has been not at all a uh, bracketed career that she likes to uh, call herself. Uh, so overall, uh, let me present ma'am, Dr. Uh, Sangjukta Chatterjee, who is here to speak on the topic, gender studies and English literature, uh, paradigms and practice. And she is going to speak on gender studies in general, as well as in certain specific topics. Now, madam, uh, the platform is yourself. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Um, till now it's uh, before 12, so very good morning. I am so honored uh, that I, you know, I just can't imagine the amount of honor that has been bestowed on me. And I'm so very thankful to the principals of the organizing colleges who took so much care in organizing this lecture on such a short notice. And I was really, uh, you know, overwhelmed. Uh, by their, by their, um, you know, sense of kindness and care, and I'm thankful to the Department of English, Kharagpur College, to the Department of English, Agra SSP College, and the Department of English, Debra Thana SKS Mahabidyalay, for having me as your resource person today. So uh, a very good morning to all the people who are listening in, to the teachers, uh, to the research scholars, the master degree students and the uh, undergraduate students and to general people, you know, people who are listening in on YouTube or other such platforms. So a very good morning to all of you from uh, from me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I am I consider myself to be a very, very, um, you know, you know, a different kind of an academic, I feel. And how different? Well, uh, all I want uh, people to know about me is more of the work I do 
um, in society than on you know paper because uh, that is what i feel the entire uh, structure or even if i contest the word structure the entire uh, you know world of feminist studies is built upon so it's this it's this intersectional space between experience and uh, literature let's say or let's say the critical sphere so the intersectional space is very important because uh, if you if we just uh, take it like this because i'm going to structure my lecture in such a manner that the students who are listening in the ug students and the pg students they would benefit for it from it so that they would be able to take in some amount of uh, you know thought i'm here to create some thoughts i'm here to ask some questions not to answer everything i am not the be it all and know it all of uh, let's say the uh, you know the uh, point of view of feminism uh, but uh, what i mean to what i mean to express when i say this is that uh, feminist studies or feminism um, is not singular that you know that you know of course you know because whenever you go through these uh, uh, books on feminism most of them have a plural attached to it so you have that s there so it's not feminism but feminisms and how do we arrive at that or from where it started i think we should have a bit of a historical journey though i am against any kind of linear uh, you know studies because i always feel that linear studies are very uh, restrictive they actually uh, you know uh, put to side the other kinds of thought that would come uh, in our minds when we think of it and i am not going to show any ppt or i'm not going to do any kind of you know picturized uh, version of my thought but rather i want it to be like a story that every woman experiences or every woman needs to go through or every woman academic or every academic uh, should know about uh, uh, you know women's studies so when we talk about the uh start of feminism now it's not that one fine morning certain people got together and thought that let's do something called feminism it did not it never did happen for any of the isms but when it comes to feminism one part is very clear that part is the part of lived life life lived lived experience even though that comes to the fore much later when we go suppose we go linearly uh, line, in a linear manner so, uh, and we the end somewhere around the uh, you know uh, the 1940s 1950s you know that time we come to know about how women have actually been uh, you know constantly trying to uh, make a mark you know to write but have not been their writing has not been acknowledged or their writing has not been accepted by the larger reading public as something worth reading so um starting as i said that if we go very you know if we go down back then when did women really think that they could they could do something different so i have actually a thought of referring to a very simple book that is very easily available in in in, in stores and everywhere that is a book called margaret walters feminism a very short introduction so that is a book i think my students who are listening in can get hold of which would give you a, a wonderful detailed analysis century by century of the journey of feminism and this book comes handy if you go for your uh, you know for your gender studies classes also because as you know that the nep has uh, been implemented in the country and that stresses a lot on the gender studies so gender studies in fact i have been i i, I forgot to give in my cv i have been instrumental in uh, formulating the syllabus of the gender studies of the igloo indira gandhi national open university so i was there as one of the members when the gender studies framework was being formulated so and and that uh, the, just at the beginning of the nep uh, uh, program so uh, it is very important gender studies right now has really regained a lot of importance when it comes to academics but as far as when it comes to like the women studies departments that's a different story which i don't want to tell out here because it's a different thing like how those departments would function and contribute 
to women's writing and reading women's uh, texts. So uh, if we go back, then you would always find that, you know, women came together in spaces that uh, that involved a lot of storytelling, as I said. So what would be, uh, uh, you know, one of the earliest spaces of storytelling? That would be the religious sphere. So somewhere the women came together in that particular space of, you know, religious sphere, and they had this, uh, the church was there, and there was this intersection and talking among themselves, you know, uh, interaction, I'm sorry, interaction and talking among themselves, and they would discuss various, uh, you know, things related to religion. And because they were more uh, into their homes, so they would be given that space to, uh, you know, kind of spread the idea of religion among themselves. So that was also a very uh, small space. Now, as I said, that linear movement of feminism starts somewhere in those religious things. But then what happens right after that? Well, um, one person that I would like to refer out here is uh, the daughter of Charles I, whose name was Batshua Makin. And what Batshua Makin actually did was that she, um, she warmly praised the role played by royalist women during the Civil War. And she, along with uh, her other contemporaries, like Anne Bradstreet was there and uh, the Duchess of Newcastle were there, and all of them together, they actually set the stage for this early feminist thoughts or early feminist uh, thinkers to actually make their mark. So um, uh, from there onwards, we definitely have the uh, secular thing taking over. Uh, just a second, there has been a problem with the uh, thing. I am not sure how to handle this. Anyway, let me just go on. I hope I'm being heard. If I'm not, please do call me. So um, after this, we do have, yeah, I'm heard. Okay. Okay. So um, after this, we definitely have various women writing in. And we have women like Margaret Cavendish, who was the Duchess of Newcastle, who was um, certainly uh, certainly not a very, uh, you know, a woman that we can overlook. She was very particular about her, about the kind of arrogance that we find much later in Virginia Woolf also, the kind of attitude that the universities actually showed. So the kind of attitudes that the universities of Cambridge and Oxford showed uh, to, the, uh, to the women academic. And in 1653, she published a book called The Poems and Fancies, where she says that all heroic actions public employments, powerful governments, and eloquent pleadings are denied our sex in this age. So uh, just because women were uh, women, let's take it because Buckler has not yet come. So let's take that women are biologically women. That is accepted sexually and physically assigned sex, uh, sexually. They are women. So that is uh, also taken for granted at that time, the early feminist stage. So that time, if you take everything into action, still see the important thing, public employments, powerful governments, and eloquent pleadings. So you are barred from jobs. You are barred from government agencies because you don't even have the right to vote, which comes much later. And you are eloquent pleadings. So you are, you are actually barred from speaking as well in, on any legal or political matter. So that kind of a silenced, uh, silenced space that was accorded to women, and from uh, from this 16 as early as 1653, which would be the early uh, the mid 17th century, we have these kind of uh, problems that are being addressed out there. So 1653 would be mid 17th century. So we all know that mid 17th century, and then onwards we have the restoration period. Now, how women are not read or how women have been silenced. I'm giving an example because when we do this restoration, whenever I have used the word restoration, all of you have thought about the restoration drama, the restoration comedy of manners and all those things. But have you heard of women like Catherine Trotter, Mary Manley or Mary Picks? 
you know they have all uh, you know produced plays they were all playwrights of this very period and in their uh, you know they have also act, acted as actresses and it was not a very respectable quote unquote socially respectable position that they um, uh, you know adorned so uh, what happened is uh, mary manley in the prologue to her first play foresaw the difficulties that they would face and uh, she has actually wonderfully written one uh, sentence uh, quoted obviously by margaret walters that i would like to read out the ma'am you are not audible hello am i audible yeah right now you are audible oh my god how long was it inaudible no it was just for a few seconds okay. i'm so sorry i don't know but i was talking about the restoration dramatists if yeah. i would like to repeat that point yes sir please so when we talk about the restoration period we talk about the male dramatists a lot the people who have actually uh written the restoration plays the restoration comedies and all but we completely and totally ignore or we are not made aware or we hardly find the time to make it to the main syllabus of certain women who were actually writing that time they were also writing plays and they were catherine trotter some of them catherine trotter mary manley and mary pink okay they had all produced various plays and they were uh, you know completely and totally uh, ignored because uh, play writing or acting in plays you know performing as actresses these these things were uh, supposed to be very uh, socially very uh, not very respectable they were they were actually uh you know and that time you know during those times like mid uh you know uh, mid 17th century it was not very easy to ignore the society which you know people can do now people are more independent now of the society but people were not independent during that time so um when uh, this lady uh, her name was uh, afra ben of course you've heard of afra ben because she was one person who actually had a, a stronger place and alexander pope actually sneered at afrobin because afrobin talked about a lot of things that women were not supposed to talk about so you know, when a play like the rover rover has been talked about then um, uh, you know people identified her to be not so much of a serious kind of a playwright so judgment that is what i'm trying to get at judgment has always and forever been um uh, one of the things that women have had to undergo whether it be in the societal space or in the literary space so when we come to the 18th century suppose we move on to the 18th century so we're talking about the mid 17th and then we move on to the 18th century 18th century age of prose and reason and all those things that we talk about and so uh during that time we have one of the earliest feminist and her name is mary astell now what Mary Astell has actually done is that Mary Astell and later on Mary Wollstonecraft these are the two women who have actually rewritten early feminism uh, in a very wonderful manner and i'm so tempted to say that uh, you know Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter is Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein much later on and the one book that she wrote that made uh, history so Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a vindication of the rights of women which is there on 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 the syllabus of many uh, universities and mary boston crafts uh, idea out there is actually what um, we would say that she has talked about uh, basically she talks about that when a female writer uh, wanted to hello yes ma'am you are audible i'm so sorry for this one minute okay is, i'll just i'll just i'll just uh, just give me one second that you are absolutely audible right now okay 
the links is the link is you know kind of sometimes it's fluctuating i'm so sorry i think it's because of a lot of um, i don't know what some problem is going on with the wifi so, okay anyway thank you just uh, keep telling me when this happens so okay. that i'm able to actually talk yeah it, it actually disturbs the flow a lot when it happens um yeah, so a vindication of the rights of women, she had written, and she sets out to speak. She says that I speak for my sex, not for myself. And she admits that most of the struggles, whatever she has seen in life, uh, you know, that she wants to express and she wants to write from that. Basically, you have that the idea that uh, the French Revolution, the rights of man that were given, that is liberty, equality, and fraternity. So those are the rights that she talks about. So actually, we have entered uh you know if i if i can say the pre first wave so if we you know we normally talk about feminism or gender studies gender studies comes much later on if we can take it that way in fact you know, feminism also comes from the uh, let's say around the 1830s if i may say 1830s 1840s but till now we have this pre feminist period where women are not really identifying themselves uh, together or in a in a very very uh, homogeneous manner. So whatever I'm saying right now, by the time I have gone to the third phase of feminism, I shall be refuting myself. That is the uh, ambiguity of this particular kind of uh, study. That is the problem or the beauty of feminism, where you really do not have a linear movement, or even if you try to trace a linear movement, you have you know multiple sides to the same story. So you have women who have said that we want to be together and we want to uh, have this uh, uh, platform and speak out and write together. And there have been women who have said, uh, who have opposed this and who have said that, no, we should celebrate the differences. We should identify the differences and we should definitely look into the differences. And there have been women who have questioned the, uh, the term feminism, which is again, uh, we are getting in the, uh, modern period, actually, 1920s, around 1920s, that questioning of the term is beginning. But when we talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, well, her work uh, set in, um, in 1792, yes, that was the year when she had written, she talks about femininity and she thinks that it is a class-based construct. So she was ahead of her times, Mary Wollstonecraft. And I'm uh, very happy to say that we do have her on the syllabus of our university. But um, when we talk about Wollstonecraft, we cannot really ignore another writing, uh, this one by a male writer. And who was this person? Of course, all of you know, John Stuart Mill, who is writing in 1869. So that's, you know, I've taken a jump and I've gone to uh, 1869. Now, John Stuart Mill and William Thompson they were uh, contemporaries and william thompson uh, you know both of them uh, they were they were writing for women william thompson's work is appeal of one half of the human race women against the pretensions of the other half men to restrain them in political and then in civil and domestic slavery that is the title of his work that came out in 1825 and john stuart mills uh, work is the subjection of women. Now, uh, when John Stuart Mill is writing the subjection of women, he is claiming that he doesn't know anything about a literature of their own. That is what he's saying in that book. Now, when he's talking about that book uh, in, in the subjection of women, he's saying he doesn't know about the literature of their own. That is a problematic space, I feel, because does he really not know or does he really not want to acknowledge it? So if it really doesn't know, then how come it is possible that women like Anne Radcliffe, Jane Austen, uh, you know, Fanny Bonney, all these, all these, the Bronte sisters, they were all write, writing during this time. How is it possible for them to, uh, you know, kind of uh, ignore? How is it possible for him to com completely not know the literature of their own? Because this is the title of the book that happens much later. Ellen Showalter writes the literature of their own. Uh, much later on. But um, what John Stuart Mill's contribution was that he had he was also an activist. He was not only a, an, 
you know, he not only wrote that book, but he also, uh, you know, presented the first women's petition in 1866, uh, petition for vote. And he also did the uh, reform bill in favor of women in 1867. Now, even the modern feminists were not very happy with him and there were problems and there were um, spaces that needed to be explored and, uh, you know, that needed to be studied. But uh, he definitely talked about divorce and other kinds of spaces that were not thought, uh, thought before him. So uh, John Stuart Mills, after John Stuart Mill, for example, we find that um, we have a different kind of a, a, a thought. That is, what is a woman supposed to do? Is she supposed to be the angel in the house or not? Because the angel in the house concept was definitely going around that time. So when this comes to angel in the house, it, it, it actually uh, situates woman or locates woman as a caregiver. Now, uh, a caregiver, a nurse, a governor, governess, you know, those, a teacher, these are the kinds of professions that women would now think of going into or would uh, be socially, again, socially acceptable. So when it comes to the socially acceptable position, we have this woman called Florence Nightingale. Of course, you know about her. And we have all seen her that carrying a lamp and helping the soldiers of the Crimean War. But whenever that uh, presentation or representation of Florence Nightingale comes, we see that, uh, you know, she is presented more as a person uh, who was uh, caring and loving. Of course, she was. But she was definitely a very good, uh, you know, an administrator who actually thought of uh, a lot more than, you know, uh, going and helping, uh, you know, in a nurse-like manner. So how a woman was represented in society that was also very important like uh, you know which uh, aspect of her life is represented the lady with the lamp that is what she was called definitely she was the lady with the lamp but she also showed the lamp to uh, the way a woman could function beyond you know uh, being a nurse and all she she organized and she had this uh, she had also actually written a novel. She tried to write a novel called Cassandra. And there, Florence Nightingale is asking, why have women, passion, intellect, moral activity, these three, and a place in society where no one of the three can be exercised? So that is the question that Florence Nightingale is asking. So uh, uh, if we just move on, we might also, before we move on actually to the next century, which is a more happening century, and we have a long way to go, but then I would definitely like to say that the idea of marriage or the idea of being equal to a man, that was one of the first things that came uh, up. And I see no wrong in that because uh, whenever you want to uh, establish yourself in this, in this world that you think is a binary between patriarchy and yourself, then you definitely have to contest against this, uh, you know, the structures that are laid for you. So, um, you know, when when um, um, Florence Nightingale is saying that she wants to be identified, uh, you know, she wants to write a novel by saying, even if a person has got intellect, even if a person has got uh, intelligence, who cares? Who cares? Because that person is only known by her gender, is only known by her biological identifier, is only known by, uh, is only known to the wom uh, world as a woman. So, uh, you, you know, it is, uh, when I was a child, I used to read uh, um, along with my mother, I used to read Shara Chandra Chatterjee, and I used to read the uh, the women characters of Shara Chandra Chatterjee. And uh, when I, uh, you know, I used to read them, I I did not find them to be very rebellious. And uh, uh, growing up in the 1990s, you know, in the age when television was taking a, you know, a, a spot, that time uh, just to read Shara Chandra Chatterjee and finding the women when they are actually giving in to the demands of men, I found them very restrictive. And I was so worried. Only much later I knew that, uh, you know, every movement has a socio-political, historical grounding. And there have been, there have been feminist movements that have tried to be ahistorical. Of course, the French feminists and all thinkers who have gone beyond history or who are, who are against any kind of, you know, these kind of uh, bracketing. But uh, if we, if we think of uh, the likes of Florence Nightingale or much later we have got, I think uh, her name was Margaret Sanger, who was a, who was a nurse and uh, who had actually given contraceptives to the, to the American, uh, the women of American slums. And she had to, uh, you know, uh, she, she was, uh, 
about to be persecuted and she had to fly to England where she had made Mary Stopes, another very well-known um, activist for women's health. And then these two uh, ladies, actually, they came back and wrote to the president of the United States that you should, uh, you know, recognize the issues of women's health. So, uh, you know, every time if we just happen to see, we see that the uh, fact remains that a woman's mind and a woman's body both have to pass through this lens of society for a long time let's say till the 1970s so now uh, what was the thing that i wanted to say before i moved on that was the idea of uh, marriage the so marriage was supposed to be the space that would actually uh, liberate women and so jane austen if you read jane austen of course of course you must have read you have pride and prejudice and many other uh, novels of course but you know how important it is uh, uh, you know to talk about marriage to the place marriage as the at, at the center of the thing so it, it doesn't really become a, a, a you know a one sided uh, talk about marriage but marriage itself becomes a an institution that regulates women that regulates society and that regulates the thought also and that is what uh, the novelists have tried to point out so uh, moving on to the next century and i am worried about the time limit so we have the uh, first wave of feminism it's a very you know the, the years preceding uh, let's say 1920s and around 1920s we have the women fighting for the basic rights and what would be one of the basic rights so if we have this uh, very uh, you know popular culture terminology then we can say roti kapra or makam so women were literally fighting for equality they were fighting for um, their rights Okay, the right to equality with men. And uh, the first, and I'm so, you know, I, I just want to go to Virginia Woolf, but before I go to Virginia Woolf, I would just say a, a few words about the, uh, you know, the suffragette movement or the suffragists. So they uh, pointed out actually that even if men were criminals and even if men were uh, you know, not qualified enough or not educated enough, they had the right to vote, but women were denied the right to vote. And it continued from 1890s to 1897, and it went on. And the suffragists, who were the, uh, you know, the crusaders for this movement, they were called the suffragettes by the Daily Mail, by the, by the Daily Mail. And uh, they had actually to fight a lot for their right to, you know, uh, vote. So they were led by the uh, banker sisters, and there, there's a lot of history related to that. But I do, I would, I would just uh, skip through it. I would just end it with that. There were these movements or these early, you know, um, attempts to establish yourself as one half of the society. Uh, you know, involved getting the rights to vote, getting the right to representation. So uh, when we move on to the 1920s, uh, we have, obviously, we have Rebecca West and we have um, the other writers. And as I have already mentioned, Margaret Sander and Mary Stopes. So I think keeping with it, we would move on to um, before we go to Simone de Beauvoir, of course, which would be the second wave feminism, I would like to talk about Virginia Woolf. Now, we all know who Virginia Woolf was. She wrote A Room of One's Own. And what is so important about that text, or what is so important about uh, modern fiction, or what is so important about Virginia Woolf? Well, one very important thing which I personally feel is the way she actually talks about economic empowerment. She is one of the first people to talk about economic empowerment because she says that if I get 500 pounds a year and a space to oneself, uh, that is all, all uh, you know, all I crave for. So in, in her work, of course, and, uh, you know, that amount of uh, like a, a, a steady amount of money and a space to study and a space to write, that space, that fight for space was literal as well as metaphorical. Metaphorical because of the same thing that I said when, when Mill says that they should have a literature of their own. And when Showalter says, writes a literature of their own, 
this entire uh, you know this paradigmatic journey from this to that this is interspersed somewhere in between by virginia Woolf's thoughts and ideas that actually bring to light the materialist concerns that you need certain spaces you need certain you know infrastructure if i may say for uh, you know for actually uh, composing your work or writing and um, apart from the thoughts that uh, virginia Woolf presented apart from the characters that she writes about in her various works to the lighthouse and all that uh, the different characters that she brings to light now one of the characters that she talks about in a in, you know uh, in a very explicit manner is the idea of shakespeare's sister so this concept that if shakespeare had a sister would she be as successful if she wrote plays would the plays be watched by everybody would she be you know uh, even though she was as gifted as a brother would she not be mocked by men would she not be you know kind of um, made fun of by men and would she be taken seriously and very sadly Virginia Woolf writes no what she would do is she would have killed herself one winter night and uh, and she would have you know she she would have never been able to come out but uh, very interestingly she also writes that she lives on in you and in me so this uh, this idea of establishing oneself as a as a very very uh, you know uh, as a very very uh, strong contender for a position in this entire uh, world of writing that particular thing is what virginia was pointed to though of course we all uh, most of us know and the faculty respected faculty listening in they would also tell you that virginia Woolf was not very happy with the word feminism she called it a corrupt word she thought that it restricted it restricted the uh, or you know it questioned the very idea of uh, you know uh, women's writing so virginia Woolf herself was not uh, happy with the word feminism so if you go by the term that who coined the word how did the word come that is a different uh, story but let me tell you that it started with the idea of the feminization of the body so the word came from like male bodies that had feminine attributes to them and uh, all these things but feminism is a word that she uh, she virginia Woolf did not really appreciate so virginia Woolf's uh, uh, movement uh, that is the modernism that was also like a journey inward that was another part not only she's talking about the materialist world not only she is talking about the uh, world where you need a, uh, you know, you need to have money to go around, because she mentions in her work that uh, she could only have the gravy and the beef while the men had the pork. I'm sorry, what is it? Uh, the partridges, the the souls and partridges. Yes, that is what the men had, and the women they you know, they were relegated to have having the food that was not so. Uh, what should I say? Elites. So uh, you know, Virginia Woolf is the is is a very strong voice lady because she talks about being barred out. She talks about being locked out of libraries, how it felt, and how she has wonderfully said that okay, it's better to be locked out than to be locked in. So the cryptic messages, you know, the way she actually articulates herself, the way she writes, I think that is why we consider her to be one of the first. And of course, her novels, you know, in her novels, the way the journey, as I said, the, the uh, stream of consciousness thing that you take a journey in what who you are, you know, that that is also very uh, important. Of course, you uh, can read more about the Bloomsbury Circle and all those things. But um, I would like to now actually move on to the second phase of the movement, which would be the uh, the movement uh, that we talk about more, that is the second wave feminism and the second wave feminism how would you remember my dear students second wave feminism well you can relate it to the second world war and you can talk about it okay the second wave feminism happens around the second world war so uh, or rather you can say that uh, right after the second world war you can talk about that so um uh, second wave feminism uh, the strongest contender the person without whom i think you know i cannot even uh, go on lecturing that person would be Simone de Beauvoir and Simone de Beauvoir actually um, uh, is writing uh, her famous work the second sex around that time now 
uh, why did I jump to Simone de Beauvoir? That is because we, whenever, wherever I have been, uh, you know, called for a talk or whenever I have organized talks, at least once that particular sentence has been spoken, that quotation has been given. What is the quotation? If I was in front of you right now, not in a virtual mode, I could have heard it. It is, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. So uh, one is not born a woman. One becomes one. This concept of being and becoming, this concept of who I am and uh, what I am, that is the thing that Bhuvar actually harps upon. So um, in in second sex, actually, a number of things she takes up. She uh, first of all, you know, if you can like limit it, then uh, the othering, the question of othering, comes to the fore. We come to know that the self and the other, this, you know, this differentiation that comes to the fore. So um, how does she actually and from where does she actually build upon her theories? Uh, of course, uh, she had a long uh, relationship with Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Sartre's work that is ex existentialism and human emotions. That particular work also, uh, you know, kind of forms one of the basis of her thoughts when she talks about the idea of essence and existence. So what is the difference between essence and existence? Well, essence, uh, normally we used to think that essence precedes existence. So you're born into a setup, or you're born into a structure, or rather you're born into a discourse. Okay, so... Uh, Simone de Beauvoir says that this concept of being with the other, so the male is the center, she, male is the subject, and I am the other, the woman is the other. So uh, the woman is the, uh, what should I say, the other version of the self. So she is the object, she is never the subject. So the question of subjectivity, subject formation, that comes into play now in the second wave feminism. So the second, the first wave feminism was all about equality. The second wave feminism is a lot about difference, a lot about identifying the differences. Okay, and where the third world feminism would, go, third wave feminism would go, uh, it was a, a Freudian slip, I'm sure. Third world feminism, I said, in place of third wave feminism. So yeah, we would be going to that. But when we talk about Sartre's essay, that is existentialism and human emotions, we see that essence dictates human actions that is what it was thought okay like a predetermined nature is there that would that would uh you know kind of dictate your position or dictate you what you are you are born into a structure you are a child so you'll be said that okay you're a girl so you play with uh you know <clears throat> certain dolls and boys should play with something else and please do not think that that is gone please do not think that is as contemporary today as it was in the 1940s okay because if not so then why do we have i will not say where but gender declarations that is also seeping into the indian society where why do we have chocolates that have genders inscribed on them that if you belong to a certain gender this chocolate is for you and if you don't you belong to this who assigns colors and please pardon me for wearing pink it was a random choice i had no intention of asserting this pink dress as a you know, for a women's studies or something. This was what I got and I wore. So I apologize for this coincidence, unintentional coincidence, because I, I do not like this ascribing thing, inscribing thing, you know. And this is what Bhuvar is also saying. She's saying that Heidegger, she, she follows Heidegger. She says that Heideggerian concept of being with other, with seen, that's what she's saying. Um, that is women, how they are an extended self and how they are living with the other. And she is actually writing, I'm quoting from her, um, women, she is for man a sexual partner and other through which man seeks himself. Hence, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. That line actually begins like this. She is for a man a sexual partner. So she is basically nothing beyond a man. She is nothing beyond uh, a particular kind of, an, um, you know, ascribing or you know, that, that that concept she takes on and she talks about the master-slave dialectic also, the Hegelian uh, master-slave dialectic she takes up from there and she talks about how the, the woman can never be 
something more than a reproducer. She can never be something more than an erotic subject. She examines uh, the myth of femininity in uh, various uh, authors, okay, like Paul Claudel and D. H. Lawrence and uh, Andrew Breton and so on. And she takes them up and she talks about that. And she vehemently opposes the way women have actually accepted certain roles. For example, the role of motherhood. She is not opposed to the idea of motherhood in that other way, but that 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 motherhood glorifies you or motherhood or you know anything related to um, a man uh, that a wife would let's say that would glorify you um simone de beauvoir has you know second sex itself is a very very huge and thick book and it has got lots of chapters and there is a chapter called the narcissist and there's one called the mystic and all these chapters actually show how Freedom from deterministic social roles uh, is needed, is required. The independent woman should not think about these kind of um, brackets because it is important for her to be economically independent, to be politically independent, and to actually oppose the constructs that have been created for her that the society wants her to fit into. So um, there is this uh, wonderful work by Toril Moy that actually talks about, uh, you know, she actually uh, comments on Bouvier's text. And I like this part where she says that there is, uh, you know, she summarizes. She says that Bouvier actually, uh, I'm quoting from Toril Moy. So she says that uh, first is her foundational insight that man is the subject. He is the absolute. She is the other. The next principle is that freedom, not happiness, must be used as the measuring stick to assess the situation of women. And thirdly, she says, finally, there is the insight that women are not born but made, that every society has constructed a vast material, cultural, and ideological apparatus dedicated to the fabrication of femininity. So Toril Moy puts to question the idea of femininity being a fabricated thing and how actually the beginning of this thought comes across in Beauvoir and then we move. She is the obviously the exponent of radical feminism. Beauvoir is exponent of radical feminism and they differed a lot from the liberal feminism and the Marxist feminism because they wanted to talk about the uh, the patriarchally uh, you know oppressed women uh, in 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 various discursive or discursive structures or in socially constructed structures. For example, a mother could not, a mother was bound to take care of the child. So a mother could not say that I don't want to take care of the child. So the moment you are biologically a mother, you have to be a social mother also. And, uh, uh, you know, this concept of, uh, you know, becomes a woman. The, the idea of becomes a woman was later taken up by Judith Butler in Gender Trouble, where she says that this process of becoming is a, a, is altogether a different process. And, um, and we'll come to Butler later on. But let's just be over with uh, this idea of the radical feminism. There were other very important radical feminists. I am choosing only a few to talk on. Uh, but then I would like to bring into focus Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan's work, The Feminine Mystic, and it is a very important work of second wave uh, feminism. And it shows how the, uh, you know, on television, serials used to come, soap operas used to come, that they used to show very happy and satisfied uh, women. So whenever, you know, throughout my lecture, if my students are listening with interest, they would say that, um, you know, everything that I have said about the early 19th century and early 20th century, that is so very relevant in 2024 also. Madam, please speak in Bengali. Bangla, bolbo, bolte pari. Kintu ekto term ne problem hobe. So, I mean, mix kore bolte pari. But I was uh, told ki I could speak in English. Uh, I would like the convener to step in, please. It's so, okay, ma'am. Uh, you may continue in uh, English and uh, as per the need, you may use Bengali. <laughs> For the veterans in your first place. And then, Nana, I mean, to Kunashi Bidamani, into 
projected on uh, various platforms as the ideal woman and what kind of woman would she be she would be she would have the highest value and she would have a certain wonderful ability to juggle between a job and a marriage and everything all those things would be there but uh, that is what very freedom is questioning how she is busting the myth of the affluent american woman and why uh, the thing that i just uh, was about to say this happy woman uh, you know happy in her home this is again you if you go back it's linked to the angel in the house concept and it is also linked to the way the woman is actually staying out of the workforce so if you are staying at home and trying to be you know uh, taking care of the family you are actually work, opting out of the workforce therefore if you have the same situation if you are doing a marxist feminist reading of that situation that would actually be that you are uh, you are actually not contributing to the economic growth of the country so that way you know every point is being criticized out there but that was my observation betty freden went on to explore the myth of the happy affluent housewife of the american suburb the other person whose work is very important right now would be juliet mitchell and her works name is women's estate it came out in 1971 so second wave feminism moves on from 1940s let's say to 1970s and 1980s onwards from 80s we have the third wave coming up but then of course as i said in the beginning that all these waves are not like uh, and everybody would say the same thing they are not into water type compartments so uh, you have to think about other parallel things that are coming up during this time but if i if i do not follow a line of thought then you would be confused shulamit firestones the dialectic of sex comes up that applies the marxist analysis of class struggle and the base superstructure thought that she takes up and she talks about uh, you know she talks about how women it, it's happening in the 1960s again little bit back and she talks about how the methods of means of reproduction you know biological reproduction should be controlled so the tension between the base and the superstructure the base means who are capable of biological representation uh, the biological reproduction but are not empowered to control it for example not empowered to uh say that i will not give birth okay and the superstructure superstructure means those who are not capable of biological representation uh, biological reproduction but can control the means of reproduction so th those people the second half would be uh, the people who uh, determined that whether these women should have the access to uh, controlling the methods of re reproduction or not we have catherine mackinnon andrea dorkin kate millet kate millet's sexual politics is very important she shows the power relationship between the sexes how it shows the domination and subordination part uh, around that time only we have two three more people whom i would like to refer to one of them is germaine greer and her work the female eunuch which came out in 1970 that actually uh wanted to dismantle patriarchy in a different way she talks about how women should withdraw their labor to render patriarchy dysfunctional you know she also challenges the myths of love and marriage and all those things mary daly in gain ecology gyn/ecology 1978 underlines the patriarchal oppression and the uh, way that uh, language should be used as a medium of uh, writing back if i may say so uh, how language can be used for subverting this kind of um, attack on women's rights so gloria steinem is there and radical feminism actually uh, went on and is still there uh, if you if you think about the present feminist uh, states you can think about that but uh, i would like to actually bring into light another very important aspect parallel aspect that was happening during this time and that I that would be the french feminist thinkers so when we talk about the french feminist thinkers 
we would definitely talk about people like can you tell oh i'm sorry uh, the microphone is one way so if we talk about the french feminist thinkers we think about christopher irigari and of course Cesu. so uh, what was so different about the french feminists The French feminists actually talked about spaces that were silenced, that were repressed. For example, hysteria, the darkness, the places that we normally don't like to go to. They talk about the pre oedipal stages, okay? And we have Christopher's Etrital Feminine that talks about how, uh, you know, the spaces that really do not come to, um, come to uh, our uh, consciousness, you know, the, those things. Uh, can be written about. Those are the spaces that need to be um, read. And um, one second, I have to take a very important call. Extremely sorry for the disturbance. I would like to move on to my talk. So I was talking about this French feminist thinkers, um, Irigari and um, I'm sorry, Kristeva, and the other one was uh, Irigari Kristeva, and the other one was um, who was the other one? I just mentioned and I forgot. I'm so sorry for these disturbances, but we have to be, uh, you know, a student was actually calling, so I have to take the call. I'm very sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, of course, I remember that was six of the last of middle science. Then. Okay. So, uh, when we talk about French feminism, we have to remember one thing that the French feminist thinkers had this Christopher's, if we, if we take Christopher, for example, she talks about this third way of feminism. Now, what would be the third way of feminism? Now, it would be to accommodate the spirit of adventure and the spirit of the nest. Okay, so uh, that is something that Toni Morrison actually spoke of in an interview. She says that there should be a quality of adventure and a quality of next. So Christopher underlines the importance of the body in the feminine discourse. Okay, and she, as I said, the pre oedipal states as stages in the construction of subjectivity. Now, uh, Christopher insists that all signification is composed of semiotic and symbolic components. The semiotic is the element that signifies uh, uh, the element of the signifying process that comprises the bodily uh, drives. Okay, and the process is linked with the rhythm and tone that is, you know, related to the maternal body. So, thereby, by establishing a connection between the uh, semiotic and the maternal body, the semiotic for Christopher is the subterranean element. Okay, and uh, that signifies the process of. Freudian uh, psychoanalysis, and that signifies that how Freudian psychoanalysis points to postulating not only the facilitation and the structuring disposition of drives, but also the so-called primary processes. So this is again what Moy is writing about Kristeva. Kristeva uses the term Kora, Kora in concurrence with the semiotic. So Kora is a rhythmic space, which has no thesis and no position, the process by which significance is constituted. So that is what Christopher is writing in Revolution in Poetic Language. That is the uh, work where she has spoken about this idea of the quorum. So everything is like symbolic here, and symbolic is the grammar and structure of signification. Christopher also says that the matter, you know, she goes on and in Powers of Horror, she talks about abjection, which is again, we, we use this concept a lot in. Uh, uh, in, in analyzing the works that deal with psyche, abjection is the process of the psyche by which the subject and the group identity is consolidated by excluding those elements which threaten one's own or the group's autonomy. So uh, various thinkers have actually spoken of all these things and there are various uh, places where you can go to read them. And one of the things that I have already advised to you is to read and know about the journey. And when we come to Sitsu, well, she also, you know, she does not like being called a feminist. Sitsu doesn't like because she identifies the feminist movement as an attempt on the part of women to, you know, 
uh, go in a different direction. She, she is uh, very famously known for her work, Sorties and the Laugh of the Medusa, among other works. She is there. We have Luz Irigare and her book, Speculation, Speculum of the Other Women in 1974, exposed the fact that philosophers from Plato to Freud have excluded women from subject position. How it has been, you know, continuously done. How people have not been able to, you know, assert themselves in the mainstream of thought. Now, these thinkers are all writing, uh, not at, like, a, um, at the same time, you have uh, Sitzo's work around 19... They are writing at the same time, more or less. Cecil's work is at the 1974, 1977, 1975, you know, 70s. That is the space when this um, thing is happening. So we have these uh, French thinkers happening. At the same time, we have got the postmodernist thinkers happening. And we have these people thinking, but they have already been uh, talking about the various kinds of gender. But then we definitely have a very, very important person coming up around this time, a bit later. Uh, the name of that person is Judith Butler. So when we talk about Judith Butler, we talk about the work called Gender Trouble. And Gender Trouble actually talks about how the idea of binary is, uh, is not to be thought of anymore. So she questions masculinity. She questions femininity. She questions the very idea of gender being a noun. She says that gender is not a noun. It is it is it is not only a uh, it is not a social construct you know sex is also a social construct so she is questioning the idea of uh, this very term and this very uh, you know the essences associated with it so when we talk about christopher i'm sorry when we talk about butler's work the idea that she brings into action or she brings into question as you all know is the idea of performance so when we talk about performance, we need to know that there should be one subject in performance. But when we talk about performativity, we think that, uh, you know, the need for a particular designated subject is not there. So gender is what gender does. So if, if someone behaves like a man, that person is a man. But then she questions the idea of man itself. So she is the one she, who takes up and who goes back and who talks about um, you know, the concept of, um, uh, what was her name? I'm sorry, Beauvoir, uh, becoming a woman, that concept she takes up. One is not born, one becomes a woman. And I quote from Gender Trouble of Butler. Uh, she says that it follows that the woman itself is a term in process, a becoming, a constructing. That cannot rightfully be said to originate or to end. As an ongoing discursive practice, it is open to intervention and resignification. So Western philosophy uh, historically, uh, you know, centered itself around the binaries, okay? Binaries of heterosexual normativity. Heterosexual normativity is something that Butler is questioning because Butler says that this is, you know, uh, not a, um, a, this is not to be encouraged and postmodern feminists contend that it is an essentialist attitude to assume that gender and sex are fixed categories. So she talks about this gender as a free floating artifice. Okay. And she claims that gender is unnatural. Okay. Since there cannot be any direct, uh, you know, um, direct logical uh, reason uh, between one's body and one's gender. So implying that having a woman's body does not mean that you have to be a woman. So such. Uh, uh, you know, a remarkable point that she takes up, calling, uh, you know, thinking of uh, delinking gender from biological sex and making it an unstable category, that she completely changes the direction of feminist studies. And that is, I think, the start or the uh, beginning when we talk about gender studies, when we talk about not only a woman, but also the other kinds of uh, you know, identities that uh, we find ourselves surrounded with. For example, people who dress as women but uh, live as men or people who uh, dress neither as a woman nor as a man or people who, you know, there are various. So the queer studies actually starts from here and we have the LGBTQ plus and we have various theories on that and you can actually uh, read those uh, 
theories, you can hear talks about them, and you can think about the various troubles that gendering and engendering can cause. So um, gender trouble onwards, we have this uh, movement. But what gender trouble also does is bring to the light that homogenization has to be questioned. And that is where, you know, we have the third, uh, third wave of feminism, third wave of feminism taking over. And we have the various other feminisms. If I may say the other feminisms, then again, I might be, you know, kind of banned that you are again playing with this uh, dialectic between the center and the periphery and all that. Because if you take the European feminist school as the center, then only we will talk about it as other feminisms. But one person whom I um, definitely would mention and whom I would like to talk about even before we go ahead, that would be Chandra Talpade Mahanti. And Chandra Talpade Mahanti's works, Feminism Without Borders, or, or you know, or, or the essay that she writes, um, uh, Western Eyes, what is it? Under Western Eyes, yes. Under Western Eyes, yeah? No, okay. So under Western Eyes, all these things are there. So what happens is we have the third wave of feminism and the third wave of feminism actually takes into essence, takes into cognizance the various factors that are um, essential in understanding a woman as an individual. So woman herself, her subjectivity or a person's subjectivity, not a woman anymore, I should say, a person's subjectivity comes to the fore in third world, uh, in third wave of feminism, which actually talks about the problems of women in uh, the African countries, the colored countries, if I may say, and in places like the subcontinent where women have their own uh, different ways of, you know, coping with patriarchy or coping with the society. So uh, Mohanty actually differentiates between the woman and the women, okay, where she makes a difference between the privileged third world woman and she uh, takes the world third world uh, she, from the Western uh, thing. She, she says that, okay, I'm taking that identifier, but I'm going to re-talk about it and relocate it in my way. So in, in Mohanty's work, what we find is how she actually wants people to realize that the situation between two women would never be beyond their um, their rooting or their grounding in socio-political, historical, economical, you know, uh, concept. So you have to know about um, the local in order to understand the problem, and then only you can think of brotherhoods and sisterhoods and all those things. So it is not possible to homogenize. It's not possible to create a monolithic construct of a woman. It is not possible to say that, OK, uh, you know, all third world women have the same problem. So you cannot say the problem between a woman in uh, Bangladesh is the same as in, in Bengal, even though we just have one border uh, across uh, that way. Or you cannot say that all the women in the subcontinent go through the same thing. So when we are when we are seeing the controversies surrounding the hijab in various parts of the world uh, and also in parts of Middle East and uh, and in India, India uh, not in India, I mean in the subcontinent, you know, we see these these uh, sporadic incidents about um, uh, you know when a woman is um, uh, marginalized or a woman is pushed back due to the caste or the class or the category she comes from, the race that she comes from, all these ideas have come out. So um, third, third wave of feminism has been, you know, varied. And I should not be using the word has been because I think it's still going on. Even though we say that no, all the all the waves have gone and now we are all empowered and all. I think that's uh, one of the uh, new discourses that is being created to ensnare us into a subjection. Uh, or rather ensnare us into subjugation to the uh, various other things. For example, we have people like um, Sherry Moraga, who's talking about, uh, you know, gender and nationalism. And she talks about the, uh, the nation within nation. Uh, when she talks about the Chicano women, we have people like her. And we have people like um, um, Donna Haraway, who is talking about the cyborgs and the cyber feminism and cyber culture, where the where the where the women are uh, how the gendering has been done and how women are not uh, either they're overtly done or what is their 
sexuality, all these things she is bringing into question. So each and every woman, each and every movement that I have talked of till now, that I've spoken of till now has been very touch and go because you know this is like it's impossible to you know kind of give you a very very satisfactory talk uh, for just um, you know a part of the um, time that i have been um, that i have allocated to myself only so if i say that i i speak for 30 minutes on the, on the three waves and finish it off it is impossible to do because it is such a vast field and it it is so uh, you know rich and it is so evolving because as I said, that gender movement has gone, there's post-feminism to it. So there is pro-feminism. There is a movement called pro-feminism that's going on. And then you have uh, movements like anti-feminism as well. So you, you have to talk about the anti as well. But uh, one of the things that I have felt is that the post-colonial feminism that talks about, uh, which of course uh, we can definitely link Moraga to it also, because there we talk about women, the concept of nation as a, as a gendered construct and how you know the woman's uh, existence is actually linked to uh, the concept of a nation being taken over by uh, another you know foreign uh, yeah. but whatever entire thing tumra purotate jodi dekho ami ekটু banglay boli tumra jodi purotate dekho dekhbe sob jagate na it's either happening on women othoba happening uh, made to happen by women mohila der diye korano hocche so I, I, am, um, I would like to say that তোমাদের এই এই যে কথাগুলো আমি এতক্ষণ ধরে বললাম ধরো আমি অনেক কিছু সেভাবে ইয়েতে যাইনি ডিটেইলে যাইনি পারপাসলি বিকজ আমি এখন কিছু ইউ নো প্র্যাকটিস আই এম গোইং টু দ্য প্র্যাকটিস আই এম গোইং টু টক अबाउट কোথায় আমরা গিয়ে এগুলো পাবো তোমাদের যে সিলেবাসটা আছে সেটার মধ্যে কোথায় গিয়ে গিয়ে আমরা পাচ্ছি বা কিভাবে সেটা সেখানে ওয়ার্ক আউট করছে সেটা বলতে গিয়ে আমি একটা কথা বলবো আই উড লাইক টু সে দ্যাট uh, when we see the praxis, we should see not only the praxis in literature, but what's happening around us. So when we think about uh, things happening around us, we only think about woman as a victim. We cannot think uh, always as, uh, you know, something that's happening to the woman. For example, a rape survivor. If a victim is a rape survivor, because তুমি যখনই এটা করছো তুমি কিছু একটা অ্যাসাইন করে দিচ্ছ সেই ওমানটাকে যে কিছু একটা ওমানটার উপর হয়েছে তো এই এইটাতে একটা নতুন কোন টার্মিনোলজি লাইক ইউ নো আমার যেটা মনে হয় যে সারভাইভারও হচ্ছে যে তুমি একটা কিছুকে এটা একটু গ্লোরিফাই করছে डेफिनेटলি আগেরটা তুলনায় ভিকটিম থেকে গ্লোরিফাই করে সারভাইভার বলা হচ্ছে কিন্তু আমি মনে করি যে এটাতে একটা মানে আমরা আরো বেশি আলোচনা করে বা যারা ইউ নো spaces actually seminars actually where we should talk about things and we should we should actually come up with some new terminologies that would not really make a, you know this unintentional equation of a woman whose body has gone through a sexual process that she was uh, opposing so jodi amader deshe onek ain hoyeche onek laws hoyeche legalities ni to ami kotha ekhon bollam ina we have so many uh, you know laws that have been done and that of course you should know not the literature money about third wave feminism i don't want to know anything more now you have to think about your own country where we have laws like uh, the laws against dowry and we have laws against child marriage and we have the poxo act and we have the various um, um yeah act which um, um, sexual harassment that workplace act the acts that actually are there to redress and to prevent poxo is for the prevention but then redressal and prevention both we have got uh, legal support in india and we are we definitely have a lot of cases that happen around us but what about the spaces that you don't identify yourself to etuku boleniye i will go to the text but ei jagah ta amar boltei hobe because i think that nowadays you know women are actually not aware of the exploitation that is happening with you for example, I always say this, that the spaces, the social media, the various, uh, you know, spaces like uh, music. Okay. Uh, I I remember that few days back, few years back, there was a very uh, controversial song. I would not quote the lines. Um, it's a Fevi Kol Se. That was a Hindi song that had lines that would equate a woman to a food, you know, a kind of a food analogy was used in that song which was of course opposed upon 
and we have the portrayal of the woman the female body now we have this uh, conditioning going on you know uh, social conditioning that if you don't look like this like this woman on social media like this uh, influencer on social media then you are really not in the loop of things so you would go into a term i've got from social media homo fear of missing out so you would be missing out if you don't make such and such a reel but do you know of the politics i have seen this that uh, suppose we are on certain social media platforms and because this is also being streamed on social media so i don't want to mention the name of the platform but there are certain social media platforms that would pause the videos that you make at particular angles of your body that would titillate scintillate you know people and, uh, and your views would go up because that is something maybe you don't want to do intentionally but that is being done with you so how would you call it how would you actually actually say that that is not pornography you have no evidence you have no idea sometimes that you are being exploited but you should be well aware of the male gaze so uh, laura mulvey and you can read about laura mulvey's theory of the gaze when this is a uh, you talk about feminist cinema analysis and all and we are talking about how women are seen through the lens the camera lens and who is behind the lens the man and what is the man trying to see the man is trying to see how you can present the woman in what light so that the uh, the audience would be happy so when we talk about this portion of uh you know this portion and obviously nowadays after the postmodern era the text is something you know anything is a text even my my talk is a text that can be you know talked upon that can be uh, you know ridiculed or that can be made uh, you know into an iconic talk or whatever so everything is like ratings that there everything depends on the trps so if if in the trps you are shown that you look you should look beautiful and you should have lot of jewelries on you and the the kind of things that um, the women are shown in the soap opera serials serials e ja dekhano hoy sherokom kore sajte hobe sherokom kore shona lagte hobe so ba sherokom kore jama kapur porte hobe you know that is a kind of conditioning that that goes on ebong tomar becoming the process jeta bolche मडार्नजेंटी people who the the women who want to go to the factory or look into the business they are supposed to be the villain but the woman who is shown even today this evening also i take the challenge that you go home and you switch on your television sets and you'll find serials that have women who you know they're having um, you know, fighting over the space of the kitchen of the home so the angel in the house thing is being right rated right now and that politics of representation is something that is going against the uh, liberation of women because women they should not be put into that bracket again it is your choice you want to be a housewife you can be a housewife you want to be a working woman you can be a working woman it's up to you what you want to do but the choice should be there it should not be done as a sort of conditioning uh, for example i know a particular lady who works somewhere nearby and i'm not saying much again on this but uh, i happened to ask her this morning that look i have got a talk on uh, you know uh, on literature and i i tried to explain je meider upore ekta kotha kotha bolbo ei mohilader condition niye kotha bolbo ta she is a widow she became a widow at the age of 21 she lost her husband and she did not marry she has a son to ami onake bollam je tumi to tui keno bie korish ni उटेडनेस ओवर एंड ओवर अगेन हाउ इन दर्स्ट प्लेस मे बी शी ने 
but social construction or the class or the or the kind of economic place where she belongs to that forces her to get married and when it comes when she, now she is doing that work she's a house help in various uh, houses she has her own money and that's why she's saying that no amar aborjona barbe from this point i would like to take a jump to mahashweta devi mahashweta devi is one of the uh, you know one of the most powerful women that we that i have ever read and um, one of my scholars has just completed his work on uh, on on some of her translated texts so when i was going through that and i was going through the syllabus i found a text called uh, hajar chudashima mother of 1084 and which is of course a very very powerful text that talks about the condition of women during the natural period so shomik um, bandopadhyay's translation that is what i have here with me and in this particular work in just a minute and in this particular work what we find is the naxalites and the landlords and how they are being uh, talked about and how they are being uh, presented okay so there's a lot of blood protest and grief that is what mohashita devi had actually said blood protest and grief so uh, mohashita devi's mother of 1084 has a kind of an an order that uh, the tribal region of nokshalbari which is very near my hometown siliguri okay it is about one hour drive from here that gave birth to that particular movement that spread all over bengal and it happened in may 1967 when a when a particular policeman sonam wangdi was killed by armed tribals resisting a police combing of the village for one of their underground leaders and the police force in retaliation fired upon the villagers killing nine including six women and two children the regional movement grew and spread fast drawing in a wide assortment of elements including a considerable section of urban students because we have various colleges and universities around that area that got linked into that student and it was a direct clash between the state and the Uh, revolters so uh, in 1970s in this particular naxalite movement mohashita devi says i quote mohashita devi i thought i saw history in the making and decided that as a writer it would be it would be my mission to document it okay so mohashita devi said that as a writer i think it was my mission to document it and um just one second there's one more text with you which i have opened here on my computer which is dauloti the bountiful that also you have so there's this of course there is an either or portion to it but i think that uh, you can read both actually that would really increase your knowledge about mohashita so mohashita there is work shows this character called shujata and you have the character nundini and uh, these um, these characters these two characters they come from very different spaces socially but mentally i think both are equally strong as rebels so if nondini does it in the uh, you know in the direct manner she fights the battle um, as an axolite as a consort of bruti who is killed and she carries the movement forward she takes part in active axolite revolt then sujata is the person the middle class educated bengali mother who actually supports the movement but cannot really move out of the family cannot really move out of the social structure and yet sujata emerges as a very strong lady because she gives full support complete support to to bruti so uh, sujata's um, you know uh, sujata's entire endeavor has been uh, to look into how bruti uh, can live on even after his death and that is why she uses her body so one person i am i uh, purposely did not speak about when i was talking about uh, you know feminism and many of you must be wondering how come she did not mention the name of gayatri chakraborty steva i was keeping gayatri d for this particular discussion so um when we talk about mohashita devi and when we talk about most of her translations many of her translations of her works were done by Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, though not this one, but Gayatri has actually talked about 
uh, in one of her essays, very famous essays, Canvas Subaltern Speak. So when we talk about this essay called the Canvas Subaltern Speak, the inference is that subaltern actually speaks through the body. So Shujata, who is not a subaltern, because she is technically, she is not a subaltern in the sense she is not a, uh, she is not, uh, you know, powerless or she is not, uh, without money or she is not without any social position but rather she has got everything that is needed she she has power she has money everything but what does she not have she does not have the freedom to openly go out and support Brophy. so somewhere she is a subaltern and how does she actually stage her protest through the pain she has an appendix problem in her body and she lets that pain linger on in her body because she wants to equate pain of losing Brophy, pain of not being able to move out of her social position, pain of not being able to go and, you know, become like Shomu's mother and join hands and try to talk and, uh, you know, kind of uh, form a sisterhood with the other people. The pain of not being able to come into the rubric of things, the pain of being, um, you know, othered the othering that she she undergoes all these kinds of pain she equates with the physical pain which would be the pain of the appendix and so she keeps that pain alive and then uh, that that particular appendix actually bursts um at the at the very end of it oh my god i think the appendix it has burst so that is how the play ends so a uh, sujata's journey is very interesting because she, because she tries to reach out to Nandini, she tries to reach out to Shomu's mother, but everywhere she faces a barrier and othering. So even though she wants to go and cross those barriers, Mahasheta Devi shows that it is not possible for us to, you know, erase barriers. But as Mahanti says that across borders, so maybe somewhere accepting your differences, you you know, you can somewhere bring the three characters on the same plane and you can talk about Shujata, you can talk about Nondini. Nondini's eyes had become blinded because she had, she was tortured um, in the, you know, when she was uh, tortured in, during the interrogation and, she, you know, a high power bulb was flashed into her eyes and she had to undergo that kind of physical torture. So that history, the history of women, um, you know, uh, writing about women, when we talk about the Indian English literature scene, and we, when we talk about the Indian literature scene, of course, Mahasheta is definitely there. But when we talk about the Indian English literature scene, we find the translations of her texts play a very, very pivotal role in showing how women have been able to, you know, resist. For example, there's another text. I'm very tempted to take the name of a few more texts, uh, which of course uh, is not there, but uh, you can of course read. That is Kunti and the Nishadins, where Mahasheta Devi is rewriting the story of Kunti. And nowadays we have the rewritings coming up. We see people writing a lot about the um, characters from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and they are trying to, uh, you know, rewrite them as Sita, the warrior of Mithila, or somebody, you know, like Draupadi as a central character, you know, rethinking things, abrogating things, appropriating things according to the need of the hour. But what Maharshita had done with Kunti and the Nishadins, she had actually showed uh, the story of Mahabharata from the perspective of the Dalits. So that Dalit feminist theory, if we say, can be applied to that particular text. And that can also be applied to uh, this text that you have the other one, which is uh, Dolothi the uh, Bountiful. I have opened the text Dolothi the Bountiful here. And uh, I would like to quote one line from there. Just give me one second. I had marked it and it's a 38 pages kind of a thing that I have downloaded. Just one second. As we go to that, uh, I would also like to mention that this um, text about Giribala, Shindhubala, and a lot more women characters are there all over. Mm. Yes. So when we talk about Dolati, we must talk about how Dolati was kept as a 
debt slave, DBT, debt slave. She was a debt slave and debt slave in the sense that she was kept as a, uh, what's the word, the kept or as a um, like a slave, you know, and she was, she was oppressed because literally it is a dehumanizing kind of a thing to keep a lady like that and to oppress. The you know, story of Dolati is that um, the text brings to surface actually a lot of sexual exploitation, bonded labor, and also prostitution. Okay, they were the kamiyas. Okay, the independence has no meaning for these kamiyas, K A M I Y A S, and bonded labor runs into the generations. Okay, the brothels also thrive, and Dolati is forced to provide the cheapest labor for a sex industry. Dolati has a father. Group Nagesia, and uh, he is a Kamiya of Munabar Singh Chandela, the owner of Sevra village. So poverty rules the region and women are treated as commodities. They are actually sold in the flesh uh, market for money and government does surveys to help the tribals, but these kind of things, they do not, uh, you know, literally poke their nose into. However, some sociologists uh, come to Palamu and and they have to see, and they see uh, these uh, uh, concept of the Kamiyas out there. And the story moves on. And I would not be giving you the entire story. If you are uh, interested, you can, you will be getting it uh, through me. If, if you want more help, I would also like to extend some uh, from my side. But basically, see, I would like to read this particular one. Um, the fathers and husbands send their daughters and wives to pay the debt incurred by them. So the objectification of the woman, the woman being used as a, uh, you know, what should I say, a compensation, a property that comes out. Ram Piyari, who is the caretaker of the brothel, ridicules the ignorance of such fathers. I, uh, I quote, your fathers, they blow me away. The animal says, marriage, he'll marry a dusar, dhobi, chamar, parhayakal, brahmanas, who burn harijans. They catch to make you a kamiya. So many. Another girl in the trade is sent by her husband to pay his debt. So like that, you know, the concept of women has having no voice, nothing in, in their, um, in their uh, state of oppression that comes in the fore. That is very much there. Now, I would like to move on to another um, text on your syllabus. That is uh, Mamang Dai's work, The River Poems. So when we come to the river poems, before we come to the river poems, I would like to speak about how the concept of feminism actually reverberates in the works of Mamangai. So uh, I'll just open the text of uh, Small Towns by the River, and then I would like to talk about Mamangai. So Mamangai actually has written a lot of texts that have taken the concept of women and women empowerment in a, to a very different level. She is a writer from Arunachal Pradesh. As we all know, she was herself an administrative officer. And later on, she took to writing. And she has written a lot of uh, books. A very, very important book of her would be uh, would be uh, The Black Hill. And, the, and uh, she has written this one, uh, uh, Stupid Cupid. That is another very important book by her. And the small towns and the river, that is the poem. Now, in the poem, we really honestly, we don't have a lot of uh, feminist thought into it. And since my lecture today is on gender and literature, I would uh, actually not go into the poem, but rather talk to you about how Mamangdai's works actually talk about uh, the issues of women empowerment. So when we talk about women empowerment, we have Mamangdai's uh, the Black Hill, where we have the central character Gimur, and how he actually uh, emerges as a very powerful tribal girl. Um, she is from the Abo tribe, and how she actually um, uh, fights side by side with her husband against the oppression of the colonial rule and against uh, the torture that her husband undergoes. So, uh, Mamangdai's works, Stupid Cupid, it is a small novel, sort of. That actually talks about how women know how to, women should know how to enjoy their personal spaces. 
so um, it, it centers around a storyline. It centers around a house in Delhi that is used as a pleasure house where women are actually allowed to carry on their extramarital affairs. So it's, it's written in a tone of humor, but it talks about othering. There are characters in the novel who move from Itanagar, who move from uh, various parts of Arunachal Pradesh to Delhi in search of job or in search of education, and mostly in search of job and also in search of education. And uh, it might bring to your uh, memory the thought uh, and the, info, uh, the, the, the news of one boy being lynched who was from uh, Arunachal Pradesh. That news was there. So it might bring to your uh, memory that thing. But um, Stupid Cupid actually talks about how this othering happens. And there is an incident in the novel where some women from the Northeast, the, uh, one woman from the Northeast, she wants to get into a taxi, but already another North Indian woman pushes her out of it. So she actually um, tries to get in again. She tries to uh, physically, you know, open the door and get in and bangs on the taxi. It's some, you know, physical um, modes of protest she, so, she shows. But the North Indian woman says, go back to your place, go back to your country. So how the idea of nation as an inclusive apparatus does not always operate, how you are othered inside your own nation and how you are othered not by another man, but by another woman, that is also very significant. That comes out in her work. So Mamangai's works have always, the river poems are beautiful, but they actually talk about death. So you also have Sylvia Plath, I have seen on your syllabus, who actually has spoken, uh, has uh, spoken a lot. I'm sorry for that. Has uh, spoken a lot about uh, death and um, death and uh, how uh, things can actually work out there. So um, I would like to actually draw uh, towards the end of my talk, but not without talking about lights out. So what is this entire story about lights out? Lights out is a, uh, it's a uh, drama, it's a dramatic piece, it's a play by Manjula Padmanavan, and she takes up various social issues in the play. She talks about the social issue uh, of, you know, uh, indifference. So we people who belong to the middle class, we have this attitude of indifference, being indifferent towards crime. So what if a crime is happening somewhere and uh, it's it's like a very serious kind of a crime and we choose to look away from it what happens what can be the consequences and also the characters are not totally to be absolutely innocent about the crime because they also try to make um, some profit out of it so how does that thing you know how does that thing emerge and how feminism emerges as issues like torture upon women and gender uh, subjugation and all these things come up. So the title of the play Lights Out is very, uh, very, very metaphorical because lights out can also mean that uh, let the lights be out and let the torture go on. Or it can also mean that, you know, the, you know, the things are always happening when there is darkness. So it is a dark comedy. And it's not it's not a tragedy because it's a it's a comedy and um, it's a black comedy. It's a dark comedy when people are in <clears throat> constant denial of things, when people do not want things to you know come to notice. So main theme of the play is associated with the issue of a gang rape. A gang rape is happening in the vicinity, and the married couple of the play, Leela and Bhaskar, okay, they hear these sounds of a woman being tortured or a sexual harassment going on and yet though Leela is traumatized but Bhaskar tells her that uh, to ignore it not to you know uh, make a serious note take a serious note of it so what exactly does Bhaskar do I would like to read out of, uh, okay who are the main characters we have got Frida who is a cook and she is a stout middle-aged woman wearing an untidy sari pleasant faced but generally exp expressionless we have Bhaskar, man of the house, Leela, Bhaskar's wife, Mohan, Bhaskar's friend, Nana, Leela's friend, and Surinder, Nana's husband. Frida is constantly in sight, performing her duties in a mute way. So she is silenced, or maybe she chooses to remain silent. 
the other characters in the play no uh, pay no attention to her except to give her orders when she has no specific task at hand she can be seen moving about in the kitchen manjula padmanabhan is a well known name as we all know she has written a lot of uh, is, uh, books and um, novels that she has written she has written on science fiction actually and she is um, a wonderful writer when it comes to dystopian science fiction also so this one is a play and in scene one <clears throat> i would like to read the setting of the scene a bit of it a sixth floor apartment in a building in bombay remarkably upper middle class large window to the rear curtains drawn back you can see the sky and you can see the two arm chairs are there kitchen main entrance all those things you can see and then uh, a normal conversation happens but uh, this is the one i wish i could share my screen but i am logged in from two different devices so i could not i am not able to show you the screen but i think it's a good idea it's a small uh, 66 pages 60 70 pages play so you can actually buy a book and uh, you can go through it but there are places where we see that how leela and bhaskar's conversation are all about um, you know trying to ignore how you are being implored to actually ignore things so that you do not have to you know get into any kind of problem so when leela actually begs and uh, please appeals to her husband that you call the police uh, bhaskar just completely ignores her and when naina leela's friend is told that you know she can hear certain sounds and all these things of a, um, you know sounds of, a, of of some kind of sexual harassment going on naina says that um, no no it is it is the sound of a local religious ceremony so naina decides to um, you know try to find out and then she says she she actually goes there she is shaken to see three men holding a woman as the court attacks her brutally when naina when naina denies to call it a religious ritual men in the play deny to call it a rape so it's it's like that you are always in a sense of denial it's not a rape frida frida is robotic she is she reminds me actually of lucky and pozo you know the absurdist uh, characters frida arranges the acids and knives and everything as if they are going to take revenge but they do not go to take revenge because it never happens they don't take that that action so what happens is as the characters are unable to come to any unanimous decision about what to do about the crime they finally decide to take snacks and make money out of it by selling the authentic rape scenes to the news channels and the media and when all these things are going on the perpetrators have gone and the victim have also left they have the perpetrators must have taken the victim and the play at the end evokes the question or provokes the observers that where does the society stand right now when it comes to the question of women's safety independence or identity so such a heinous crime as rape such a dangerous thing as rape or any other kinds of torture on women are usually uh, handled in this manner that people are actually you know they try to um, just overlook it padmanavan throws a lot of light on the man woman relationship and how the patriarchal power is still dominant in the society it i think this play came out around 1984 if i am not mistaken and uh, it was it was the time actually that coincides with the third world a third wave of feminism if you are aware of uh, if you remember what i just said the status of the woman and the plight of her suffering between two influential beings firstly a man who with his age old dominant power has a control over uh, the woman and secondly a woman who turns into an instrument under his authority this becomes a you know um, a microcosm of what is being uh, you know what is happening in the society at large so when we talk about gender and literature when we talk about the role of women uh, you know women characters being shown in literature how these women characters are actually um, you know drawn into the loop of things to show the uh, present status of women we must remember one thing that women characters are not completely free of everything you cannot say that they are beyond uh, society or they are beyond any kind of uh, brackets okay 
Yeah, so, um, Frida, Frida's character is very interesting also. Frida's character, I would like to just talk about it because Frida is actually a representation of us. We see things, we want to take action, but something prevents us from taking any action. Even though our intention is clear, but maybe our silence. Maybe we are we are afraid of the consequences that if we if we speak, there might be problem. So that thing is there. Um, am I am I there? Hello. Uh, yes, madam. There already. Okay. So with the on that line, I would like to open the floor to discussion actually, uh, because I have spoken more or less on uh, the topics, and uh, I would like to open the floor to discussion. Is it okay? Uh, ma'am, uh, I mean, uh, how many questions uh, can we entertain? Actor, do you think that the Kazakh Nakira come question as a second? Now the forum is open for. Uh, Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Just a second, just a second, please, sir. OK, OK. OK, following our speaker's insightful presentation, we will now be holding a question and answer session. Please feel free to raise your hand if you have any question or comments regarding the topics covered. Uh, hello, if you if you also uh, I would like to say connect the boli. If you don't feel like uh, raising the question, you can send the questions to me. And I would definitely send the answer through Mr. Shaku. I would send the answers back. But then you are free to ask me any question. Or, or if you want me to discuss any point more or anything, uh, any aspect, it would be nice. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. You are. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, ma'am, Adi, for this wonderful session. So, though I missed the first portion for late joining, please pardon me for that. But uh, I have a query, Dee, when you beautifully uh, pointed out the problematic, uh, you know, the terminologies like victim, why the society calls victim, whereas they should call as survivor, a strong survivor. So, the victim word is uh, degrading the person. Okay, so who goes through the traumatic suppression? But I am talking about the word rape, quote unquote rape itself. Okay, recently uh, the health ministry has advised the doctors not to use the word rape in medical terms. So in medical reports also on uh, sexual assault victims and even it uh, in court dispo uh, depositions. Okay, so rape is not a medical diagnosis. We cannot say that it is a uh, we can say it is a legal definition, right? So the word should not be used while uh, forwarding opinions. So uh, for me, uh, the I'm just asking that uh, according to me, rape should be claimed as more than a crime like murder because murder is like one time death, right? A physical death. But uh, rape is such kind of a death that is the psychological momentarily every moment it is a death okay so uh, I don't know whether you have pointed or, or whether you have covered this point about the rape so what is your take in this rape terminology only and why we should call rape literature really everything rape related that's all thank you Ivana thank you I am so happy uh, that you joined in and you're listening I'm so happy for that uh, yes, uh, as we all know that um, rape itself is a very, very uh, disturbing term. And uh, what I really feel is that <clears throat> rape literature, but rape terminology, yes, yes. Why this term is so much, so much valuable? Because rape is not a, a you know, medical term. It is actually a legal term. So why should we call rape literature? That's the question. 
it is always it is always a thing that is it is always a part of the discourse i feel that of domination the discourse of domination that when you are able to overcome or overpower a woman's body then you are more victorious than any other thing okay so uh, you see the newspapers they will show they will present the news of rape on the very first page because that gives a kind of a you know um, i should uh, i'm very sorry to say but a kind of inquisitiveness it generates a kind of perverted inquisitiveness okay when people want to know more how the rape happened what happened what exactly went on and you have um, you have this popular culture you know initially in the 1970s and the 1980s when hindi films were ruling when the films were ruling india you know when the uh, film industry hindi films were dominating regional films were not so uh, accessible or not so overly seen or we did not have so many devices and so many places and spaces to understand films i'm talking about films because they are a very powerful source of molding popular opinion during 1970s there was this particular quintessential hindi film villain who used to say that um agar tum mere baat nahi mana to tumhare biwi ko utha ke le jaunga tumhare beti ko utha ke le jaunga and there was this heinous thing that the son stands and the mother is being raped so as if one man one man's possession is being taken away by another man so sexuality of the woman doesn't belong to herself her yeah. you know mm-hmm. when the rape is happening it's not that the woman's body is only being violated but the associated things along with her the social status of the family kisko muh dikhaunga tera aise kaise ho gaya you know all these kind of things come i mean were taken into account but slowly if you have films like in the 1980s and 1990s really saw a change when i i cannot recall at this moment but there was a very nice film where i think uh, uh, the central character was kajol or aishwarya who was actually uh, you know who had actually undergone this experience of uh, physical violation and she was that film too was questionable because there it showed the man as a very large hearted man because she, he was accepting this woman uh, and you know so the, the the rape doesn't happen once that is what you're saying and that is what yes. i am saying too it doesn't yes. happen once it continuously happens and if i don't mention the film called pink and if i don't mention the film called uh, you know uh, you know when a woman says no you know uh, that is what being highlighted in that movie called pink where yes. you know the woman gets raped every time the story of rape is being done and that is why it is a kind of as i said a kind of perverted pleasure in reading news about rape so i think that is what has brought the term from the parlance of legal uh, sphere or medical sphere into this particular uh, thing of popular culture so it is you know popular media you know people and nowadays social media where you have the you know you read and you think nobody is watching so you read more how many people raped her how many times she was raped what happened to her so uh, in this context i am so sorry i did not mention dropadi when i was talking about <coughs> excuse me i was talking about marshita devi so when you have dropadi's character there in marshita devi and at the end of it uh, she says that not one of them is a man you know that kind of a uh, you know a, a, a wonderful a loud roar comes out of dropadi and she says that why should i wear a cl- any cloth to cover my body because none of you are man enough so that is the kind of thing that mohashita is actually trying to say that a woman's body should be her body and it should be her body to write and rewrite it should not be something that should be uh, you know dictated by other people so this the answer to your question would be people are talking about rape or people are using this term because they are getting a kind of uh, perverted happiness you know from that thing okay also if and then women are doing it when when men are doing it i would talk about perverted thing what what take do you have on women reading such news somewhere the woman is thinking okay thank god i was not raped i did not have to go through that so yeah. again that othering of that particular person who has had to undergo that kind of brutality that comes to the fore so the woman uh, is actually always and at every moment of time at the juncture of gaze so when the rape is being written here written there car rape kemon kore holo kothay holo rate beriche to nirbhaya case was so heinous 
we yes. all know that so how yes but when we are actually seeing je otar upore kono ekta series ba kono ekta cinema it's gaining a lot of popular attention to etate dutu jinish hoy ekta hocche kichu sankhar man shobai to perverted noy some people are getting a kind of vicarious satisfaction that okay je nay ta ba jeta oke dite onek shomoy legeche seta hoyto oi cinema tate ba oi particular representation tate it comes faster it comes quicker because it's a you know a timed thing a limited time thing so there what happens is you feel okay you know justice has been served or justice has been given so you feel happy but there is also another section who think of it okay what uh, what were the forms of torture she had to undergo how her body was found why did she have to go out with a boyfriend why did she go, have to go out at night so it's not that one incident but it's the entire situation of that incident or the entire situation of that person that is problematic out there thank you for asking this question thank you so much thank you so much any other question onno kichu banglayo kora jabe banglayo kora jabe madam may i say something here yes bolena yeah madam you spoke about uh, mahasuda devi uh, can you please uh, say something about indigenous eco feminism because her characters mostly belong to indigenous tribes uh so intersectional eco feminism from that angle indigenous eco feminism may uh, please you are studying at uh, let me tell you you are studying at uh, which college if you ask oh i am from devra college i am a faculty member department of english i knew it because <laughs> because i uh, didn't expect uh, uh, you know ug students to say that so oh, okay, uh, okay. yes yeah so i uh, see actually we have this concept of indigenous eco feminism in mahashita definitely but yes, yes. when we talk about eco feminism you know what it is all about it is about sustenance right yes. it is always about sustenance so it is not a like a, a eco feminism when we talk about it see one very important thing which i feel is that um most of eco criticism is about women that's that's a very uh, biased opinion maybe to stay on such a platform but i feel like that because when we go by the chipko andolan if you take the chipko andolan that andolan that happened the chipko movement that was a women were there and there was this and another women another women centric movement which i cannot recall right now that was not the chipko there was another one where also women took the lead so in mahashita i have not been able to read on those lines so i won't be able to tell you right now where in mahashita we get indigenous eco feminism but definitely i would like to get back to you on this question but yes indigenous eco feminism abounds everywhere so if you can entertain me you can tell me that which text you would like me to talk about because the text that i have referred here they do not have it aya yeah, dropodi abhi belong to belongs to the indigenous tribes or the book of the hunter Absolutely. or the witch but we do not have eco feminism there yeah because uh, we do not have eco feminism we have indigenous indigenous is a different see indigenous eco feminism would be something like how the tribes you know if you talk about indigenous eco feminism to me i would talk about mamang dai i can give you example from the eastern himalayan studies that we have been undertaking and we have we have stories of uh, women you know uh, who are actually trying to protect the environment in various ways those kind of narratives are coming up for example um you know uh, suppose a character from a novel tries to grow some paddy or crop on the ground without disturbing the uh, you know the uh, the environment then it would be like that so i would like okay. to go through it and i would like to take you know i'm not really well equipped at this point of time to say indigenous eco feminism in mahashita and i will not talk anything okay i get to know your point in this perspective can we name sarajosis budini and uh, 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 anis sarajosef is a very relevant name in that case i think isn't it yes so? it is it is yes yeah. yes yes, yes thank you thank you so um i think uh, it's almost quarter to 2 and uh, if there are no more questions then i would like to log out but if you want to ask me something about uh, uh, see basically feminist studies or gender studies it has actually uh, relied on one very important thing that is women's rights to education and women's rights to um, you know sexuality 
so these are the not women's rights like human rights let's say so when we when, when that evolving thing happens now between from feminism onwards to suddenly we have this movement into a wider study into a gender uh, kind of a study then we have the women talking about um, the, we have people talking about their sexuality because they're questioning the heterosexual normativity you know they are talking about you have agent rich and you have uh, we're talking about the a continuum, the continuum, the lesbian continuum that they talk about, and how women's histories have been, uh, you know, erased purposely so that women do not come out. But Mah Mahanti is actually going against Showalter. When Showalter is talking about that we should have, uh, you know, in feminist criticism in the wilderness, that's the name of the essay. She, there she is talking about the need of having a separate, you know, a discipline, an organized discipline of feminist studies. But Mohanty is much later saying that if you're doing that, what you're actually doing is you're actually creating, there was this patriarchal set, now you're doing something related to the matriarchal side. So if, if or the feminist side. So that is not done. You cannot make it a conglomerate of things. You have to be very careful to the differences. You have to pay attention to the individualities. You have to pay attention, for example, Dolothi's problem and Dropodi's problem are similar but different. They're not same. For example, Shujata and uh, um, Kunti maybe, they are also in a similar situation because Kunti also had to live with the Kauravas and Sujata is also living with the family who are equivalent to the Kauravas. So, you know, you have these spaces that where Mahashita very cleverly, you know, places the question and you are left to think and to ponder about it. Okay. And protest is not very easy. It is, it is like only people who are reading books, you know, uh, but what what would I say? Only people who do not have any link with activism would say that protest is very easy. You raise a hand and there's a protest. That doesn't happen. It is easy to be uh, an activist on social media. And it's a totally different thing when you have to go to a victim's house or a person's house and you have to explain to that person how to come out again and come out and lead the normal life, quote unquote, the normal life. That is not an easy thing to do. Or even simple things. How to persuade a mother to send a child to school. That is also a different thing. That is also another kind of activism which I feel, especially if the child is a is a girl. Even today, do not think, do not for once think that feminism. There is no need to read feminist studies or that. Indigenous feminism is a is a concept that we can definitely talk about. But when we talk about indigenous feminism, also I do not think it should be a, a monolithic term. You can actually unravel it and read it in various ways. So well, women in fiction or women in writing. The way women are represented everywhere, that is uh, evolving and changing every day. So going back to Butler, we are always becoming. We are always in a state of becoming. OK, so Kanvena, any more questions? Uh, I don't think that there is any uh, other question. Uh, so ma'am, uh, please, before you, uh, you, you leave the platform, uh, let us convey our uh, gratitude to the board of thanks. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, after the vote of thanks, we will uh, officially end the session. Now, uh, for the uh, vote of thanks, I'd like to request uh, Ms. Shreyoshi Roy, uh, the head of the department and uh, one of the joint conveners of the program, uh, to please take over the session. Ma'am, please. Yes, uh, well, as uh, thank you, Kothika. Well, as we draw to a close to this enlightening session, I, Seoshi Roy, on beho behalf of the Department of English, Egra SSC College, Kharupur College, and Devrathana SKS Mohavidala, want to take a uh, moment and express my heartfelt gratitude to each and everyone for your participation and engagement. Uh, and uh, I would like to express uh, our sincere gratitude to Dr. Shankita Chatterjee, Madam, for gracing us with your profound knowledge. And, you know, she has highlighted uh, from the very beginning the, that uh, feminism is not uh, just a singular or linear concept, rather a polyvalent amalgam of diverse, multi-layered uh, ideas and and she has uh, meticulously, you know, elaborate uh, the history of women's uh, literature uh, chronologically and make the critical intersection with the literary history of women's literature. 
She charts the social, cultural, and historical conditions that both shapes women's writing and prevented it from being recognized or valued by literary history. And she has also touched the vast array of literature uh, like Mahashweta Devi's Mother of 184, Dalithi the Bountiful, and uh, Sylvia Plath's poem, Mamang Dai's Dreamer poems, Manjula Padmanavan's Black Comedy, uh, The Lights Out. I, uh, so, Madam, I we deeply appreciate the time and effort you invested in uh, delivering such an informative uh, uh, session, and uh, and you have enriched us uh, thoroughly to understand the topic. Thank you once again, and we will look forward for more such kind of interactions. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much. Uh um, respected uh, conveners and respected principals of the colleges. Thank you all the faculty members who so patiently listened to me. Thank you, my dear students. Uh, you are my students. Uh, everyone, everyone, everywhere who is listening to me uh, and who is a student is my student. That is what I feel. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would like to say that, uh, you know, one last word. See, let it not be uh, you know, limited to literature, let it not be limited to only seminars and talks and all. And then we switch off our devices and go to rest. And then we see somebody, you know, getting, um, you know, either that person is getting othered in the field of literature or getting othered in the field of academics uh, because that person is not a member of the dominant gender. Then we should rise in protest. So on those words, I thank all of you. Thank you, Shreyushi, especially. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shahu. I'm sorry, Mr. Shahu. Mr. Shogata Shahu, thank you so much for your uh, kind interventions. Thank you, Mr. Pothik. Uh, these are the three names I got hold of. Yes. So thank yes. you all. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you thank so you, much. Madam. Have a good day. Have a good day, madam. Thank you. Same to you. Can you will collaborate with us uh, once again in near future. So yes. We'll be organizing such programs. <laughs> we no, actually, actually, you know, it is very difficult. Uh, I find online platforms very difficult to actually uh, express myself completely because oh. I see myself in the uh, in the device, and um, it's very you know it's nice to be uh, you know to uh, talk to people firsthand that is always better but then i thought that why not actually start in this manner so that i can interact with the people um, and even if someone has any question that person can send those questions to me so that won't be a problem i will definitely send materials and questions whatever is relevant thank you so much thank for you so me. much madam thank you so much you will seek uh, the opportunity to meet offline madam <laughs> thank you thank you sir well, uh, now I extend our sincere thanks to the participants of AGRA SSB College and uh, and uh, uh, and the dignitaries and uh, and the research scholars. But first of all, let me thank to the principal of AGRA SSB College, Dr. Deepak Kumar Tamili, Dr. Vidut Kumar Shamandu, principal Horupur College, and the part and the principal of. Debra Thana SKS Mohabidala, Dr. Rupa Dasutta for being the backbone in our endeavor. And a warm thanks goes to the faculty members of three colleges and the organizers and the IQAC of these colleges. I thank all our students, research scholars, dignitaries, and all good hearts behind the scene for their unconditional love, cooperation, and support in making this session possible. And as we depart from here, let us carry this good vibes to promise to continue this uh, drive, innovative drive, and uh, foster collaboration in our respective field. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for, uh, for your contribution. And definitely, we will look forward to our paths crossing again in the future. Thank you. Have a good day.